Bouncing back is harder than it seems. For Christians, for those who are walking in the faith of Jesus Christ our Savior, we can find ourselves sometimes in the same place with sin in our lives. And while sin has many faces, our goal should be to get back in the game. Forget the former things, God's word tells us. Do not remember the past and focus on living a life in Christ. We have to be able to bounce back. We should do everything possible in our life to make sure that we bounce back into that right relationship with God. How do we do that? How do we let go of the hurts, those selfish tendencies we may have, and put our life back on the right track? How do we bounce back? So one problem we've already talked about this year, and for many people, is what are we looking at? What are we trusting in? For many people, they have found a form of Christianity that fits their lifestyle, a form of Christianity that fits what they want out of it, but they fail to recognize that they have anything to bounce back from. They don't perceive that their sin is a problem. Now, this is easier than what we might think. It's very easy to convince ourselves that we're walking with the Lord and we overlook those sins that are keeping us down. I've said it many times. I can justify a whole lot of stuff with my mind. You can too. Modern Christianity, our modern society, has somehow convinced us that the bar that Jesus set isn't up here. We, we pushed it down so low that anybody can get over it. But let me remind you, the bar hasn't moved. It's still the same today as it was yesterday, and it will be forever. When God says, do something, he means it. When God says, do not do something, he means it. And we have to follow this. Now, Peter... I love Peter. He gives us a great starting place. 1 Peter 2 1 says this. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Wait a minute. I mean, that sounds like a good starting place. So, what we've been talking about so far in this year is we have to examine ourselves. Let's examine our lives. Do we have these problems and sins in our life? And let's look at it. Let's take an honest look at what's in our life. How are we doing with it? And I don't want to burst anybody's bubble here, especially my own. But if you're doing well or not doing well, regardless, if you're doing really well or if you're not doing really well, there's evidence that reflects how you're living your life. You know, we shall be thankful that we have a gauge. We should be thankful this is a good thing. Many people say that is a bad thing. I know. This is a good thing. If we have a gauge to tell us how we're doing, it tells us how we're doing in our spiritual walk. But again, the question is, how do we make sure that each and every day I am walking in step with my Savior? So Peter gives us some helpful advice for this as well. He says, make sure you're longing for the things of God. 1 Peter 2, verses 2 and 3 says this. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, Peter said. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Peter's telling us, as partakers of Christ, and as a life that we are living in Christ, we are to get rid of the problem. The first one was malice. Get rid of the malice, he says. Well, what's malice? Well, malice is any evil or ill thoughts that you have, maybe against another person. These thoughts can cause us to even wish for revenge. This malice can have us looking, we hope something really goes bad in our lives. You may even secretly wish harm or tragedy to come and 
so is not. It can even be so simple as hoping that a person doesn't even receive blessings in their life. Peter says, you don't need this. Get rid of this. It's a salad. It doesn't taste good. Next, Peter warns us about deceit. Deceit is any form of dishonesty. It may be cheating on a test, falsifying tax returns, as we're at tax time. It can even be an untruthfulness to a spouse, a family member, or a friend. We can even have deceit in our lives about Jesus. Peter says, well, don't, don't have it. Get rid of it. Next, he brings up hypocrisy. If we claim to have good Christian beliefs, if we have this standard, but yet there's some activities in our life that don't reflect it. Get rid of it. Get rid of these things. We may act like we have the love of Christ. We're going, oh yeah, I got Jesus. Let me tell you. But all the while, our motives are self-serving. It's hypocrisy. Next, Peter brings up envy. I think we all know what envy is. It's jealousy. Jealousy we have in our life. It has many, many different forms. But listen. Every form of envy takes our eyes off Christ. Every, every form of envy takes our eyes off Jesus. Get rid of it. You do not need it. And lastly, Peter says we should have nothing to do with slander of any kind. Too many people take liberties when they're talking about other people. And we do it in the church. We're really good at it in the church. Oh, I love so-and-so. They're so good. They're so good. But let me tell you what they do. Oh, you should hear. Oh, did you hear about it? <laughs> Peter says, do not spend any time, effort, or energy on these life-sapping activities that do not help us grow in our spiritual walk. But I love Peter. You love Peter? Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. So Peter here, he's going to give us a better alternative. Peter tells us, crave pure spiritual milk. So that by, by you can grow up in your salvation. Crave the character of Christ in your life. Why? So you got that. If we have in our life, it's so much easier to bounce back. When life comes at us from many different directions and we have Christ in our lives, we can bounce back. So what does it mean that we are to pray pure spiritual milk? Well, first of all, pure spiritual milk is what helps a believer grow in Christ spiritually. Then the ultimate goal of a believer should be to crave anything about James. We should truly seek after him. Jesus gave his life for us. We are called to give everything back to him. So as believers in Jesus, we are to build our lives on Jesus. Because Jesus is what Peter calls our cornerstone. We've all heard this before. I love that thought. I, I know you do too. The idea is once that cornerstone is placed just right, just perfect, it's in the perfect starting place, then everything that comes off that corner is going to be right. If the foundation is wrong, everything that gets built from that place will be wrong. Jesus must be the foundation. And if Jesus is our foundation, we have a great place to begin. Amen? Amen? That's a good thing, amen? Amen. I hope you're all awake. Mm -hmm. Something. Mm -hmm. But let's look at what Peter says about 1 Peter. In 1 Peter 2, excuse me. This is what Peter says, verses 4 and 5. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. 
Now look at verse 4 again. As you come to Christ, as you come to him, the living stone. Now look up here for just a second. Do you see that stone is capitalized? The word stone is capitalized because this is not a rock you're going to find in the parking lot. This stone is the Savior who has power in our lives, and he has power for endless life and all eternity. This stone is the eternal God. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, and he will never end. He will never fail. And as we just read, of course, we already know that this stone is Jesus Christ, but he was rejected by humans. He's rejected by men. One commentator says this about humans rejecting the cornerstone, and I quote, In their stupid, selfish, amateuristic blueprints for life, Insignificant, short-sighted men can find no place for their creator and redeemer. Just as there was no room for him in the end, there is no place for him in their plans of their life. Ouch and amen. It's not very politically correct in this day and age. But it hit the mark. Pretty squarely, I'd say. But here's the plea from Peter. Peter's telling him, don't let this be you. It doesn't have to be. Do not let it be. You're different. You're wiser than this. You're smarter than this. If you weren't, you wouldn't be here. So what you, you're building your life, you're building a spiritual house, and in this spiritual house, Christ must reign. Christ is central to everything that we do in life. So if we're craving this pure spiritual milk, which is good and nurturing, then our spiritual house is going to have one vital component that absolutely identifies it, identifies it as a spiritual house. And this is vital. Our spiritual house, our lives, must be a place where Jesus dwells. I would love to believe that Jesus dwells in Aztec Church of the Nazareth. Amen. But I can be assured that Jesus dwells in Aztec Church of the Nazarene if he dwells in his people. Amen. We want Christ to dwell in us. We want Christ's blessings. those spiritual blessings that come from having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Build a spiritual house where Jesus lives. Now Peter gave us a short list of sins that can help that can stumble us in life. A few we talked about were malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander. Paul gives us another list. He gives us another list when he wrote to the letter of the church in Corinth. This list in, includes quarreling, rage, rivalry, slander, arrogance, disorder. Again, the basis of sin has many faces. It can look in many, many different ways. But as spiritual houses where Jesus dwells, we do not crave those things. We do not remain in those sins because this spiritual house is God's house. gave his life for us. We should crave, we should long, we should desire to have our lives 
must be a living sacrifice for God. Amen. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2 says this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. It's His good, His pleasing, and His perfect will. We should get an amen after that passage. Amen. One of my favorite passages in all Scripture. But notice, it doesn't say, you know, offer your bodies and sometimes. Be a living sacrifice for whatever it's convenient for you. Paul is giving us the exact same message that we heard from Peter. Crave after, long to be transformed from away from the world and crave after the things of Christ our Lord. Now one major step in offering our body to Christ is longing to remove the sins that plague our life. Let's just be honest. We may have some sins that we kind of like. We don't want to get rid of them. We cozy up to them like a long lost friend. We may keep them hidden. But we don't recognize them. Throughout scripture, this is a reoccurring message that we are to rid our lives of sin. First Thessalonians says it pretty clear that we should abstain from even the appearance of sin. And the reason that we should take this so seriously is because Paul tells us the wages of sin is death. Our sin leads to death. But praise God, that's not where he wants us. Amen? Amen. Praise God, that's not where he wants us. Praise God, that's not what he wants for us in our lives. God's will, God's greatest design for us in this life is to have a share in His everlasting glory. And that's for all eternity. This is a free gift, Paul tells us, to all who believe in Jesus Christ as God's one and only Son. So if you're still not convinced, let's look at John. Let's look at what the Apostle John wants us to know. Now, John, I love this. This is so awesome. John wrote a wonderful letter. And he wrote this letter as a desire for all of us to know. Well, he gave us some words of wisdom that we could live by. And, and he gives us some Gentle guidance. Um, he gives us a direction for our time here on earth. Now, what I love about this, and I, I, I don't know if I can really get this image portrayed right. Have you ever had someone older than you that you love, wiser than <laughs> you, that you respected, and, and they came and they just gave you a simple, simple, Phrase and some words of advice that were so loving, so caring. And when you heard them, it was like, bam! That's amazing! These words were like, I've never heard this before. And, and you take them and you just, they just stick with you. This person just gave you some great words of advice. Maybe it was a parent, maybe it was a grandparent, maybe it was, I don't know, a mentor, I don't know. But this is what the Apostle John wants to give to us. Now, we're going to be back in 1 John. Now, when John wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, it's believed that he wrote these letters way late in his life. Maybe up to 85 or 90 AD. Jesus 
anticipated on for 60 years when John wrote this. But these words are written as a loving father figure to anyone, to anyone who would hear these words. And he wants you to meditate on them, meditate on them, and let them just sink into your life. If you have your own lives, open them up to 1 John. 1 John. Now what we're going to read, he even starts out, he says, my dear children. My dear children. Now that should give us a warm fuzzy feeling. Unless you're one of the teens around here. The teens might go, I'm not a child, I'll think it. <laughs> but I love this, this thought. He's saying in a deep and sincere manner, my dear children. I want you to hear this. I want you to see what I'm trying to tell you today. Stand with me if you are able for the reading of God's word. We're going to be in 1 John 2, verse 1 and 2. Just two verses. It says this. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for yours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Amen. Now don't sit down there. I want us to read verse 2 together. Join me in reading this. He is the atoning, the atoning sacrifice, sacrifice for our, our sins. sins. And not, not only, only for, for ours, ours, but, but also, also for the sins, sins of, of the whole world. world. This is the word of the Lord. Amen? Amen. 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 You may be seated. Now, the first thing we need to recognize here is that this is the Apostle John, one of the disciples, one of the inner circle, the disciple that Jesus loved. And he gives to us don't miss this. He gives to us a standard. What is that standard? The standard is this. The standard is that you will not sin. Read it on the slide. The standard is this. That you will not sin. Because God is perfect, and because God is the standard, we, too, are called to be perfect. This is what Jesus himself told us in Matthew 5. Be perfect. Nowhere in Scripture do you read, God is perfect, and I know that you're not, so just try to sin as little as possible. As you're going through life, just try not to do too much. It's it. God's word would never tell us this. God cannot condone any sin. So he wouldn't want it in our lives. Remember 1 Thessalonians where it tells us, we should abstain from even the appearance of sin. The appearance of evil. So not only are we called to get rid of the sin that may be in our lives, get rid of the appearance of sin in our lives. But did you notice the words of John? Love this. He says, but if anyone does sin, now let's take that phrase for a moment. John says, if anyone does sin, and that phrase could and actually should be translated, if anyone does sin and it will happen, meaning that we are all sinners, we all fall short of the glory of God, that's not the standard. It's all he wants. It's not a part of his design. It should never be the goal of a believer. But the difference is this. We all fall short of the glory of God, but if we do, we have an advocate. Someone who's going to help us. The problem is this. We have to ask ourselves, are we comfortable in our sin? If we are comfortable in our spiritual walk and we are convinced that we do not need to keep working on our relationship,
relationship with Jesus Christ, we've got a problem. If we have a sin that we're holding on to and we really don't want to get rid of it, we have a problem. The difference is this. It's not what he wants, so we can actively and diligently work at removing those sins from our life, and we move toward the standard that was set by God the Father. If we are living with the desire to rid our lives of all these sins, if we crave pure spiritual milk, then we are promised, don't miss this, we are promised the power of the Holy Spirit to be in our work in our lives. If we crave pure spiritual milk, guess what we need to do? God's fast. When we fall short, we can bounce back. When things don't go our way, we can bounce back. Because it is the power of Christ that's dwelling in us. Amen. So don't have confidence in this. God wants nothing more than to have a close and personal relationship with all people, with everyone. That was part of his desire for even before Adam and Eve stepped foot on this earth. Even though we may fall, even though we fall short of the glory of God's will in our life, the question is, are we living in that? Or are we working to conform our life so that we bounce back from that sin. See, Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus, and he told us that when we conform to the ways of the world, we're dead in our sins. If anyone craves after the ways of the world, they're dead in their sin. If that's what we want, So as believers in Christ, when we fall short, when we sin, our desire should be to quickly recognize that what we're doing is not what God's will is for our life. We have to be so in line with God the Father that we should want nothing more than to bounce back with God. Praise God. Amen? Amen. Let's bounce back with Christ. Because He is the power that contains us. He is the power that lives in us. He is the power that dwells in us. And He is our life. Give yourselves, make sure you're doing everything you can do. Give yourselves the tools so when those trials come up in life, they don't keep you down. Look out that. Our takeaway today is this. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but bounce back to conform to the pattern that is Jesus Christ our Savior. God is good. Amen? Amen. And all the time, God is it's good. good. And he loves each and every one of us so much that he gave his life to die for us so that we can have the power of Christ to help us regardless of what happens. Hmm. As our praise team comes back to the front, My prayer is that each and every one of us, we crave after, we long for, we seek after each and every day for those tools to help us. They can help us rise from the ashes and bounce back and do not allow the enemy's schemes to keep you down. So let's just take a moment. Let's reflect on our own lives. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Just want to ask you, how are you doing today? Do you have all the tools you need to bounce back?
God's word says that it is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, so that we can know the righteousness that is God the Father. Are we in his word? Are we in his study? See, knowing and following God's word helps us to bounce back when life hits us hard. And with the power of Christ, nothing can stand against us. Praise God. But how do you grow that? Do you trust him? Are you putting your hope in him? Or are you living each and every day the way you see fit? What's good for you? My prayer. That we, as we leave here today, there is no doubt in our lives that Christ dwells in us. If Christ dwells in us, we have the promise of His power in our lives. That's what we should long for. That's what we should crave. That's what we should seek out. Church, just let me ask you, how you doing? Do you find yourself struggling with trusting God? Would you be so bold as to raise a hand today? I just want to pray for you. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Church, our world has told us many lies about church about what it means to be a follower of Christ. What it means to walk with Him. So I pray that today, from this point forward, we do not long after, do not crave after the things of this world. But we look to the love of Jesus Christ. Church, if you are willing to be so bold to make a statement, to say that you want to make every day a statement, craving after and longing for the things of Christ, would you stand today? If you want to crave after and long after the things of Jesus, stand right where you are. Yeah.